Happy Sabbath, saints. Oh, that's good enough for me. If you didn't say it, that was your chance. I'm not going to chide you into saying any more. Some of you have been coming to me, and, um, and I've been shameless about not remembering your name. But it's even worse than that. It's, I don't know where I've seen you before. You ever do that? You ever run into people and you know you should know them? You look into their face or the way they looked at you or shouted at you or it rings familiar with you, but you just can't quite place them. Well, I've had that happen all day today. It's because you're all moving around. But that's part of the problem is that we remember because of the context. There is um, something about seeing a person's face in the context in which you met them. And so when you see that face or you hear that voice in a different place, in a different environment, it's a little confusing. It's not as clear. There is something there, but it's not right. And so as we look at Scripture... It's like that as well. Next three sessions, I'm going to walk through a passage of Scripture that is so familiar to you. You might want to just go sit in the cafe, or you might just want to just uh, check out. I'm here to say, I found, I found a, a story, and it finally fit in its proper setting. It's like I'd been paying attention to this one passage of Scripture for such a long time, and then I saw it. I saw the face of this passage in its setting. So I want to look at that with you over the next few days because somehow I think the most important thing for the church to do today, and I say that not because I'm just throwing around the superlatives, the most important thing. There will be people who offer all kinds of paradigms and subjects, suggestions and notebooks and things like that, but I'm here to say that I believe the one thing that will shape, reform, transform the church today is a much bigger view of God. Calvin Rock wrote a book. The book was entitled, Your God is Too Small. I think sometimes we have a tendency to look at our humanness and measure it. But over the next three sessions, I want to challenge us to think and to watch and to wonder. And just trust me. It's a ridiculous thing for an American to say, I know. <laughs> but I dare you. See, that's what you do to the Australians. You just challenge them. I dare you to trust me with this, please. Allow this story to expand your view of God some. And what will happen is our lives have a way of moving in the direction that God intended us to move in. If you're looking around at your world and your church and yourself and your own walk and you are not satisfied with what you see, then this story is for us today. It'll take three days at least. And hopefully I won't be thrown out after tonight. Shall we pray together? Precious God, um, I invite you on behalf of my brothers and sisters to come to this place. We've sung our songs and we've spoken to you through our hearts and music. We have testified and oh, what praise we have given you, Lord. It's, it's really the best we can do at times and it's not quite enough, but Lord, hear our hearts. Today, we are open to your leading, and we long to see a view of you that will 
really teach us and grow us and shape us in the ways that you had planned for. So we thank you for fulfilling your promise in us tonight as we open your holy word. In your precious name, amen. In Luke 15, the story is set. Most people don't even pay attention to the first two verses that begin this amazing passage of Scripture. It'll be very familiar to you, but we are going to walk through this passage today, or part of it, so painstakingly slow in word for word, but we're going to do it not from the perspective of an Australian or even an American or a European. We're going to go back to the setting in which the story was told. And we'll try and look at it through the eyes of someone living in the Middle East, in Palestine, during the time in which the story is told. But I'll just simply begin with verse 1. It begins. It says that, all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. This encounter is what begins one of the most profound and timeless tales of all of Scripture, if you ask even the most secular person out there, they know what it means to be a prodigal. But what sets the story in motion is a complaint from the Pharisees, the religious leaders, that Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. Now, what's strange about that in this parable Jesus is clearly reacting to conflict. Who is in the room? The sinners are obviously in the room. They've just had a meal. Who else is in the room? Well, the Pharisees and the scribes are in the room as well. As I was contemplating why this story starts this way with this strange conflict, I, I began to wonder. It reminded me of a story that has been recently told about eating and drinking in the Middle East. You know, throughout the Scriptures, I counted five times just this afternoon, it says in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke that it says that Jesus ate and drank with sinners and received them to himself. There's a book that came out. It's called The Lone Survivor. Now, this book is written by Marcus Luttrell. And in the book, maybe you have heard about it, um, it's about a Navy SEAL team that is planning an attack on Taliban forces near Pakistan, just right there on the border. Uh, the story goes on throughout this narrative that... Two goat herders happened upon this small company of Navy SEALs, these highly trained special forces soldiers. And when these two goat herders happened upon them and they saw them, there was a moral conundrum among the officers of that small company. They had to respond to these two local goat herders that just witnessed them. Now, according to the mission protocol, it was well within their rights to quietly eliminate these two witnesses to their position because what would end up happening is, is they would go and tell the Taliban, their own people, that there are American forces ready to attack. And so they had to make a decision, but these are two innocents. One of them was a 14-year-old boy And that day, Lieutenant Murphy made the decision to leave the two goat herders alone. 
They chose not to stop them. And as the story unfolds, they revealed those two goat herders ran and told the Taliban. They revealed the location, and the Taliban attacked this small company and destroyed all of them but one. One remained alive but wounded, not just with lacerations but with bullet wounds. He was trying to escape, and he escaped by falling down a ravine and landing in a small creek at the bottom of a ravine where he was discovered by villagers, local villagers, who took him in. Now, this is significant because what it means for them to take in someone, foreigner, or not, is of tremendous meaning, not just to the story that we're looking at, but to the grand story that we're trying to talk about here today. To take him in is to extend what they would call loke. It is more than just a level of hospitality. In the Pashtuni tribe, this principle of extending coverage to someone, that if somebody is in need and you bring them into your home, you are not just bringing them into your house. If they come under your roof and you bandage their wounds and you feed them a meal, especially if you sit and you eat with them, it is called Loke. It is this century old principle of care and ownership and brotherhood and sisterhood. It is the kind of community that is so rare in the world. And yes, it exists in one of the most rudimentary areas of the world, a part of the world where people say is unsophisticated. And yet, perhaps one of the most powerful pictures of something that I believe God has created in this people exists and lives stronger and beats like a drum louder than the things that we might shout and sing about. Loke. Lieutenant Murphy was taken in by a local village. It's even more impressive that part of what it means to extend this kind of coverage to someone is if you bring someone into your home and you bind their wounds and they gathered up all of their medicines for him to heal. And this small group of people were not only feeding him meals, but the children began to play with him and he became a loving friend of that community. It was not only their obligation to take care of him at that point like their own family, but to defend him against their own people. So when the Taliban eventually came toward him and found that he was there, they were going to attack the village, but they learned that they had extended this coverage to him. And while they did everything but break the rule. They beat some people and harassed them in the village, but they never came in to break the rule of Loke. The Taliban knew he was there, but they couldn't break this tradition that was older than the countries that they were fighting against. They assaulted and harassed, but they had to wait and watch. That local family, that local community made contact with the Navy and made it possible for safe passage for him to make it home. Look, hey, it's the way they do it. And if you travel to the Middle East, you know there are not, it's not the only culture where hospitality is a way of saying, I'm binding myself to you. When Jesus ate and drank with sinners. It wasn't just a meal. It says that he was binding himself to people. 
in an unmistakable, amazing relationship. I learned a little bit about this when I was assigned to serve in the city of Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> I was right out of college, and um, so I was looking for recreational opportunities because I like to play sports and I like to exercise. And I was alone. My wife was still finishing up um, two months of school back in the South in Tennessee, and so I was up in Michigan by myself, and I had brand new church members, and I was learning. I was working with a public evangelist, and I was just trying to find my way. And so I was looking for a group of people to play soccer with. Well, in Michigan, there are two seasons. There's winter and the 4th of July, and that's it. It's cold there. And there's a lot of snow, so they play soccer indoors through much of the year. And so I found a stadium that played indoor soccer, and I went out to that stadium. It was in 1992 that I went there just as the Gulf War was ending, the first Gulf War. I looked inside this giant facility, and I was alone as I walked in. But one of the dynamics of that part of the city was that many of the people who were refugees from the Middle East, from the Gulf War, came to that part of the state. And they were there in that little northwestern corner of the city of Detroit. Hundreds, thousands of people from Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Syria, all throughout that region, there. I remember walking into that facility and I had my bag with my shoes in it. I'm just kind of looking around lost hoping someone would just pick me. I didn't know how to sign up or volunteer. There were hundreds of people in there. And as I stood there looking awkward, a man at a table had been watching me. He was from Iraq. And he walked up to me and he said, would you come join us? And I said, yeah, I don't know. He says, you look lost. <laughs> And I said, yes, I, I don't. How do you get on a team and how do you play? And he looked at me with his just big brown eyes and he said, you will come play with us. And I went over to the table and I sat down and I had never been in a more foreign setting in all of my life. There were men and women and little kids, the children were looking at me like I was a monster, but they were there. And we sat around this table and they began to talk to me and ask me questions and I would ask them questions and I soon learned I was in way over my head in a very simple way. They covered me. I went to play with them, and I played for a whole season with this community of people. Occasionally, we'd talk about religion and faith, and many of them were of the Muslim faith. And as we talked, there were even moments where we would ask each other pointed questions. But most of all, I listened and told stories, and I asked questions. And I asked questions about this story. What do you think? And I learned. But most of all, what I learned is, is that in that part of the world, if you eat and you drink and you bring someone in, you are part of their family in such an undeniable way. I learned that. And so now when I read this scripture, the scripture that's 2,000 years old, it's like seeing someone's face that you know you should recognize. And now it starts to make sense. Why were the Pharisees so upset with Jesus? It's because Jesus chose to bind himself to people in an unmistakable, irrevocable way. It says in the text that Jesus, in response to that, 
spoke this parable. Okay, saints, is the word parable singular or plural? It's not a quiz question, come on. It's a singular word, right? So which parable is he talking about? Because we know that there are several, right? There's the parable of the lost sheep. And then there's the parable of the lost coin. And then there's the prodigal son. And then there's that other guy, right? The add-on, where if the preacher runs out of time, he forgets about the older son. It's likely that we've missed the boat. He says he told them this one parable. This is one story, one purpose, really one message with four parts. And they all pretty much say the same thing. Walk with me through the passage, if you will. Jesus actually asked the question, which one of you, having a hundred sheep, and loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one until the, the one that is lost is found, until he finds it. Which one of you is the phrase that he begins this with? Now, who is he talking to again? Keep that in mind. He's talking to the, the Pharisees. Which one of you, to say this to a Pharisee, was in a way to challenge them? It was a way to challenge the way they viewed the world you may have heard back then that people, um, how did they view shepherds? With honor or disrepute? They didn't like shepherds. Shepherds came into the category of those people who were not held in high esteem. They were considered unclean by the Pharisees. Either an immoral person, it was in the classification of being a, quote, sinner, Sinners had two categories. Those people who were considered immoral, in other words, you just behave poorly. And then there was another classification of sinner that had nothing to do with the way you behave, but it had to do with your occupation or your nationality or who you hang around with. You were considered unclean. And there were certain trades that people had that were considered disrespectful. And shepherds of all the trades out there was in the category according to the Pharisees of that time as being one of those disrespectful trades. Now, isn't that seem interesting to you? How is it that they, these leaders and people, the scribes are involved in this, how could they know the scriptures by memory and think a shepherd was a nasty creature, an unclean person. Where did they get this? Why? Well, because Moses was accepted as a shepherd, even if you read in the Midrash. It describes Moses searching out a lost sheep at the time that God calls him to lead the people out of Egypt. What's that? Shepherds are filthy? Your leader, the one you claim, spoke on behalf of God, the very law in which you memorized. He was a shepherd. Unclean? What's the matter with you? Ezekiel referred to kings as shepherds in Ezra 3. God himself was thought of as the psalmist sings it. The Lord is my what is the matter with them? Can you imagine what must took place in the mind of a person to have this visceral notion about people that's so different than what you might think? You see, they could operate just like everyone else, and you and I can. You can agree with ideas in your head as long as they're only ideas but that fundamental disagreement comes when those ideas make their way into flesh and sit across the table from you. Please tell me that I'm not the only one who can believe things in my mind and actually live a different way. It's not only possible, 
but it's what we are susceptible to as humans. So to say to this crowd, Jesus could have said, there was a man out there who had a hundred sheep, and that would have been fine with the Pharisees. Oh, yes, there's obviously a man out there who has a hundred sheep. That's what those shepherds do. They have sheep. But that's not what he says, is it? No, 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 no. He says, which of you having a hundred sheep, what does Jesus do if he is talking directly to the Pharisees? He basically says, you are responsible for the sheep. What have you done? Which of you having a hundred sheep? In essence, he's saying to the Pharisees and scribes, all right, I want you to think like a shepherd. Oh, that, that must have caused a gag reflex in the back of their throat. The ones who know God's law, his history, the mission, can so blindly fail to see their job was to be shepherds, to help those who don't know God, to help them love him. That was their job. If you had a hundred sheep in those days and in that culture, you were extremely wealthy. A wealthy person with a hundred sheep would typically send a hireling to go look after the sheep. Or if one was lost, you would hire a person to go do that. But there's a problem in that. If you didn't care about the sheep, if they were just numbers to you, You'd be sending out somebody who had no ownership. And so the only thing that that person would be doing is, I gotta go find some silly, stupid animal. And then when I find it, it's gonna be six kilometers away from home. Because that's just what sheep do. And when I find it, it's gonna have a broken leg or a thorn in the foot, or it's just gonna be so ridiculously swollen. I'm going to have to carry a swollen, smelly sheep that's not even mine all the way back over steep, rocky ground. The whole thing's going to be on my shoulders, this fat, swollen, smelly sheep. You know what the sheep's going to do at some point in the journey, don't you? I don't have to say it. That's going to happen on your shoulders. And I'm going to walk this thing back six kilometers home. If you were that hireling, what would you hope to find? You would hope to find that sheep dead somewhere so you can make your nice little stroll back and say, sorry, it's dead. That's what a hired servant would do. That's what a slave would do. But what would a shepherd do? A shepherd who owned the sheep, what would they do? They would carry it back over rough terrain. It's a dangerous task. And the text actually says something else that's kind of amazing to me when I look at it. Just linguistically, it says that this shepherd, having lost one of them. Did this shepherd, I mean, remember what we said last night? Did God lose us? Did he cause us to go away? Now, wait a minute, we'll get to that again. But remember what we're attempting to do here. We're attempting to expand our view of God. Not to make him less, but to make him more of us. But the text says that he lost one of them. He says the story. He declares this. If you had a hundred sheep and you lost one of them, taking ownership of the situation. You know, in some language, I think this is true in Spanish, but I could be wrong. No, I'm pretty sure it's true in Spanish. This phrase is spoken differently. If you were, to, um, if you were late to catch a, a train... In Spanish, you would say, the train left me. Or if you dropped a plate on the ground and it broke, you would say, not I dropped the plate, but the plate fell out of my hand. 
and crashed on the ground. There's kind of a little separation from ownership there. Now, as I shared this with some of my students, you couldn't believe what they came up with with this. My homework failed to be completed. (laughs) Or I tried this one out. I'm sorry, officer. The car exceeded the speed limit. (laughs) My wife comes home, and I say, the dishes did not get clean. What happened? (laughs) But here in this story, Jesus says, if you have a hundred sheep, You lost one of them. It's taken responsibility for the losing. It's not blame, because let me just say, blame is an immature and selfish response in human relationships. It's built on fear, but responsibility is a better word. Last night we referred to believing in in a God who becomes big enough in our mind to assume responsibility for the condition of the world. Do not give credit to the evil one for everything. You know what he has done and what he started in the human experience. But let's let's not make evil and goodness co-equal. They are not. Lucifer was a created angel. And he is not in some conflict with Christ where they wrestle back and forth, trading blows upon blows back and forth. That's not the way it works. He was cast out of heaven. And the only way that God saw in his way of doing things, in his world, which blows my mind and stretches my thinking, is to be willing to take us all on a very long, arduous journey that at certain points of history get dark, but he was willing to take us through that in order to take us home one day. And if you think there is a better way to get us home other than paying for us and walking that road to the cross, then you might as well suggest it to him. But in the absence of a better plan to redeem all of humanity and restore the character of God in all of the universe... And to find some sucker out there that's good enough and willing to pay for us, ah, I suggest you offer that suggestion to God. But in the absence of a good solution, what do we have? We have the best solution. Where God says, I created you with the ability to choose and a willingness to allow things to go wrong, even if it means I have got to right them with my own sacrifice. I will do this. I don't have a better way to explain this other than say our God has to grow so big and great in our mind that we allow him to be the winner of this great and mighty story. He is big enough to tell it for us. And I'm okay saying, all right, what do you want me to do? What can I do? Isn't it interesting that it says that does he not leave the 99 in the wilderness? Remember reading that? Or is the image in your mind that when he left the 99, they were all safe in some paddock or some fenced-off area or perhaps in a cave? He doesn't leave them there, though, does he? According to Jesus, he leaves the 99 in the wilderness. What might that have said to a Pharisee? Were there other moments where people wandered in the wilderness waiting for what we call a deep, true repentance? You remember how often the children of Israel tried to fight their way into God's graces? All these things we will. Uh, did it work? 
Why couldn't they just read three verses before that says, I have borne you out on eagle's wings. I have redeemed you from your slavery. I have purchased you from the Egyptians. I have a plan to take you to a land of milk and honey. I will make you a kingdom of priests and kings. I have done these things for you. And what did they say? We got it from here. All these things we will do. He left the 99 in the wilderness. And for so long, I thought they were safe in the pen. The image of the shepherd going after one and leaving the others bundled up safely at home. But as Jesus tells the story, that's not where they're at. And there's a reason for that. Later, Jesus will say there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who don't think they need to repent. Now, are you hearing the story clearly? He's bound himself with a bunch of sinners the way they were supposed to bind themselves to sinners. He has extended to them the invitation to eat and bring coverage to them the way they were supposed to do it. And on behalf of the name of God, with a sense of they were to go after them until they found them, but they didn't. In this story, we have a new definition of repentance. Well, if I were to ask you to give me your definition of repentance, what would you say? Well, some of you might go to the Greek and say, well, the word metanoeo, <laughs> don't even know if I pronounced that right. But the word means to have a change of mind. That's not good enough for some Adventists. They say, no, 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 it's not, it can't be just that, because we need a changed life. Well, the word actually implies that. It implies that you're walking in one direction and you change your mind in such a way that the direction of your feet change direction. But it's mainly a change of mind. Metanoeo, repentance. But Jesus redefines the word here a little bit for us in the context of this story. Notice, it says, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, and he says to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need it. What does it mean? according to this parable. So what did the sheep do to stir up a sorry spirit in his heart? Did the sheep bleat? Does it cry out? Does it confess all of its sins? Does it, I mean, have you ever done this? Have you ever felt in order to warrant the grace of God, you have got to somehow suffer? inside. You have got to exploit all the brokenness inside of you. Bring it to the front and say, here it is, God. Now can I have some grace? In this story, we see this image, this beautiful image, a new definition of repentance where it simply accepts the vital truth that you have been found. Accept the truth that you have been found, rescued, saved. Because the hardest part for your humanity isn't obeying the rules. We know how to try to do that. The hardest part is believing that someone could, would, and their payment of your life is secure. It's harder to do. I'd rather just keep the rules, frankly. I can keep the Ten Commandments rather easily. And I didn't just lie either. I'm not tempted to sleep around in my wife. I'm not tempted to murder anyone. I don't have the guts to pull a trigger or throw a punch. 
And if you saw my neighbor's yard, it's not half as good as mine. Well, maybe that's something. That maybe arrogance should be one of the, But I've got a nicer yard than my neighbor. I don't covet anything he has. My spinach is richer in vitamins than his. <laughs> I just planted my spinach the other day, so can't wait to get home and share it with my neighbor. <laughs> that's bad. Except that that's what the sheep does. What does the sheep do? It gets carried home. And the only words that we have in the text are there is more joy in heaven over one sinner than over 99 people who need no repentance. Let's look at the next story. Or, <laughs> who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. And now what does he do? If being a shepherd wasn't bad enough, now what does he say? Or what woman, having ten silver coins, loses one coin? In this parable, what does Jesus so dramatically do? Who is the shepherd in the first parable? It should have been the Pharisees, but it's not. He says that he is the shepherd. God is the shepherd who goes and brings people back. And now if it's the woman who loses a coin, who is God? You don't like to say it, do you? All the women are saying, I hope somebody says it. Somebody, he better say it or he's going back to the United States. That's right. In this parable. Jesus uses a woman to describe God. That should not shock us if you have Genesis in your Bible. For man and woman together make the image of God. And so he says, I'll say it through a man, a shepherd, and I'm going to say it through a woman. And I probably won't say it again, and I probably won't be invited back. Actually, you folks are pretty good. What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses a coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house until she diligently finds it? Again, in this passage, it's the woman who loses the coin. But then again, they search until they find it. What is that? Searching until you find it. We have our limits for searching, don't we? We have our limits for evangelism. We have the things that we are willing to do and the things that we are not willing to do. We have limits. You have a standard by which you'll reach out to people. We all have um, a level at which we will give. We have limits, don't we? According to this passage, what God is calling people to is to mirror this notion that we need, we won't get there unless we remove the limits of what we're willing to do to restore people. We only help certain people, only some of the time, as long as it's safe and as long as it's measurable. But there is this, this, Mount Everest phrase that says, until they found it. Can you say as a church that we search until we find? I'm not talking about advertisement. I'm not talking about um, opening our doors and having a bulletin and welcoming anyone who comes in with a smile. I'm saying, do we search until we find? Has that ever happened to you? Because in that story and in the story of the woman who lost the coin, it's the same definition for repentance. The coin doesn't cry out. The coin doesn't deepen its sorrow. The coin simply is found. And those who are repentant are those who accept that truth. Is it possible out there that there are people who are ready to accept the truth that they have been found? 
And is it also possible that throughout time and history and a narrowing view of God, we may have made it very difficult for them to accept that? I take the responsibility for that on myself. I think I have made it difficult because of my narrow view of God. In the first parable, Jesus calls the Pharisees to be like shepherds because God is like a shepherd. And now Jesus depicts God as a woman. In the process, Jesus elevates the worth of all women by so closely identifying himself with a woman. But the truth is the same. Are we ready to do it all? When I was in Africa, I carry this with me because um, I was serving in Africa for a short period of time and um, a community of believers decided to take this commission, this challenge seriously. That they were going to do everything they could to reach the people who lived on the the western side of Lake Malawi, a predominantly Muslim, Muslim district. And they began to go after people with this notion that there is a savior that has found them. They did everything that they possibly could. I remember we came out to help them and I remember standing at this stadium with thousands of people on the lawn, but there were these eyes in the darkness back by the trees. And when the lights would shine through, you could see eyes like you do at night of animals, but there were people. And I asked, what's going on? He says, those are the people that we will not give up on. I said, who are they? What are they? They're the Muslims. <laughs> the what? Those are the people in the village that can't come out in public and listen to the story of Christ, and so they come to the trees. But we have a plan. Well, how long have you been working on this plan? We have been working for years to try and gather and share and help. I told the story of Christ and did my very best. I received the next time I went, about a year later, this hijab. It's the garment that women in the Muslim world cover their heads with. It's a, it's a symbol of um, honor, but it's also a distance. It's a covering between us and, and God and the Almighty. And I received a, a note with this in the package. It was from a community of faith that decided to take this seriously. Her name is Kilael, and she said, I've become a Christian believer, and I have found my faith in Jesus Christ to be enough. I've had to leave my community, but then she went on to describe the slow, expensive, timeless, tireless work that that community of people did to restore one woman. Of the thousands that were standing back at the trees, they kept going until one, they found her. She removed herself from that community and they gathered around her with a home. The church provided a home, schooling for her children protection for her when she was in town. They went and restored her. I decided this year that I'm going to devote my life to relentlessly pursuing the mission of God to reach people until they are found. And so, what does this mean for us today? 
What is this beginning of this story? Because it's just going to repeat over and over again. I have no other message for you. So if you like what the primary kids are doing or if you want to go see juniors and wash cars and do other things, you're welcome. This message will get repeated in some different ways and maybe it'll land on your heart and ring a bell in you. But I'm here to tell you that this is what we're meant to be about. Jesus defends his mission by eating and drinking with sinners and binding ourselves to the brokenness of humanity. We have to get dirty. The story is told in the hearing of sinners, but directly to the leaders, your view of God has shrunk so much that your work that you're doing is not working. We must recognize that this story is a challenge for us as a church today, that we, the believers, we, the believers, must mirror the mind of God toward humanity all of humanity for as long as it takes. There is no pause and no rest. There is no new invention. There is no new plan. There is no new generation of kids that's going to pop up and do it for us. Old, young, middle-aged, and whatever I'm at right now, I don't think I'm middle-aged yet. i got to be close, though. For all people, we must, as one church and one body, be about this. And here's the kicker for me. The most prominent theme in both of these stories is a celebration, a rejoicing that someone has been restored. What if you belong to a church where its highest moment was the celebration of God's restoration in people? What if that is the thing that just drove us crazy? Wouldn't you love to be part of that? I know I would.